Hi, I'm Jonathan Eder, and this is the piano lesson. I'd like to talk to you today about major scales. How do you construct a major scale, and why is it even important? Well, if you're going to compose a piece of music or play a piece of music, you're going to use some set of notes, ordinarily from a scale, some kind, as many scales, the most common being the major scale. And uh, there's different ways to think about the major scale. Uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, simplest ways to think about it is as a set of eight notes. So um, starting on the key of C, on a C, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's a very common major scale. Um, there's actually 12 major scales altogether because there's 12 notes in our system of music. There's 12 starting places, seven white keys, A through G, and five black keys. Some of those scales can be spelled in more than one way. Those are referred to as anharmonic scales. There's three of them. But uh, thinking about the major scale in other ways is also important. For instance, uh, rather than thinking about the major scale as eight notes, one after another, uh, let's start thinking about the distance between the notes, which is even more important in many ways. Now, there's names for the distance between the notes. The shortest distance between two notes is referred to as a half step or a semitone. And very simply, it's just the distance from one key to the very next key. So, uh, for instance, if I went from E to F on the piano, um, that would be a semitone or a half step. Uh, if I went from F to G, that's not a semitone or a half step. That's actually two half steps. Two halves make a whole, or it's referred to as a whole step. So <clears throat> think of the major scale as a series of intervals, the intervals being the distance between the notes. Uh, F and G, you can think of that as a whole step because there's a key in between. Uh, e and F, well, there's no key in between. Um, E down to E flat, well, that's a half step. And uh, for the purposes of this particular scale, we're not going to be playing any black keys. The C major scale is the only major scale that has no black keys or no sharps or flats. Um, but if, again, if you're playing a piece of music, you want to know what the right notes are. And the right notes, essentially, are the notes of the key you're in, and more specifically, the, the notes of the scale that we're using. So if you were playing a piece of music and you were looking at a key signature, the key signature being the part of the music at the very beginning that has the sharps or flats, um, well, you wouldn't see any in this case. Now let's go one step further. We've talked about the scale as a series of eight individual notes. Uh, in this case, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. We can also think of it as a series of intervals, uh, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. Let's organize them in a different way. Let's think of those eight notes as two groups of four notes, referred to as tetrachords. Tetra just means four. So uh, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Those are two tetrachord groups. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, take a look at the tetrachord group. C, D, E, F. Let's look at the interval pattern. Whole step, whole step, half step. I'll do that again. So from C to D is a whole step. From D to E is a whole step. And from E to F is a half step. Again, we're thinking about the intervals, not the notes themselves necessarily. Now, the last four notes in the scale, G, A, B, C. G, G to A is a whole step, A to B is a whole step, and B to C is also a half step. So I want you to notice something, if you haven't already, that the pattern, the interval relationships in the first tetrachord, the first group of four notes, is precisely the same as the second group uh, that we've looked at, that the tetrachord group. Whole step, whole step, half step. Now, you don't want to um, get confused by the fact that those tetrachord groups are separated by a whole step. We're not thinking about that at this moment. We're just thinking about the two tetrachord groups. And another way to think about the separation of these two tetrachord groups is that the second one, starting on G, is a fifth above the first one, starting on C. 
an interval of a fifth is a really important interval in music. Uh, among musicians, it's, it's maybe the most important. And music ordinarily is based on intervals of a fifth. So um, how does this help you? Well, if you're going to learn scales, you want to learn them in the simplest way possible. You also want to be uh, learning in a musical way. And ordinarily, in, in a piece of music, while we do have uh, songs that are in one key, uh, like the key of C, that would use no sharps or flats, they don't often stay in one key. They often do what's called modulating, even though the key signature doesn't change. And when it does that, it usually does that by intervals of fifths, often up a fifth or down a fifth. So we're going to go up a fifth now. Um, again, these are the two tetrachord groups for the C major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Um, we're going to take the last four notes of the C scale, and those will become the first four notes of the new scale, the G scale. We're going to recycle them in, in a sense. And that's a complete major scale. So I just finished playing the G major scale. Let's look at those tetrachord groups again. Again, the first uh, group of notes, whole step, whole step, half step. And the second tetrachord group is also the same. Whole step, whole step, half step. Again, separated by an interval of a fifth. Um, don't confuse the whole step in between, but both tetrachords follow the same underlying structure of intervals. Whole step, whole step, half step. Whole step, whole step, half step. Whole step, whole step, half step. Again, a half step being the distance from one key to the very next key. In a major scale, uh, we, th we think of the major scale as having whole steps between 3 and 4 and 7 and 8 in the, in the terms of scale degrees. So if we count the, the notes in the scale, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, there's your half step. And 5, 6, 7, 8, there's your, there's your next half step. So to build another major scale, well, Logically, we're going to go up a fifth. We're going to take the last four notes of the G major scale and form a new scale on D. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. That's the new scale. And if you, again, look at the tetrachord groups, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step. And I'm going to do that down an octave just to be a little clearer. Whole step, whole step, half step. That's our first tetrachord. Whole step, whole step, half step. So you see, we're, as we're creating new scales, we're building on the tetrachord of the old scale. Uh, you, can, you can go backwards, right? You can take your right hand and replace your left hand. And now you can construct the G major scale. Again, take your right hand, put it over your left hand, and now form the C major scale. Let's do that one more time. C major scale, first tetrachord, second tetrachord. I'm going to take my left hand, put it over my right, replace my right hand with my left, and now I'm going to create the G major scale. Now I'm going to again do the same thing, take my left hand, put it over my right, replace the right with the left, and now I'm going to create the D major scale. And I want you to notice as I spell the notes in the scale, I'm going in alphabetical order, D, E, F sharp, G, and then of course the alphabet starts over again, there's no H in the musical alphabet, A, B, C sharp, D. Um, you can spell these black keys in, in one of two ways. You could spell this note as an F-sharp or as a G-flat. I'm choosing to spell it as an F-sharp for a very simple reason. When you spell any major scale, we go in alphabetical order, and each note in the major scale has its own unique letter name. That's what a musician will be looking for when they're reading music, and it'll be forming steps. And as you read the notes, one note head will be on a space, the next will be on a line, the next will be on a space, or you know, 
that, but that's the general pattern that it will form. Um, so this would be on space, on a line, on a space, on a line, on a space, on a line, on a space, on a line. All major scales are constructed that way. And the only difference is the accidentals or sharps and flats that are put in there. So um, this is the fastest, most efficient, most practical way to learn scales. And you can learn them very, very quickly. And again, there's 12 scales. E, B, and see how I'm progressing building one scale on the next. Again, we're starting on a C, then G, up a fifth, up a fifth to D, up a fifth to A, up a fifth to E, up a fifth to B. Now I'm getting a little high on the piano, so well I can drop down an octave or a few octaves just to give myself some more room and again continue the pattern F sharp C sharp or D flat let's call this A flat I'm going to jump down another octave or so because I'm kind of running out of room so we'll jump down here down to E flat B flat F That's what we refer to as the circle of fifths, or sometimes people refer to them as the cycle of fifths. It really doesn't matter, but if you continue this pattern, eventually you'll have done all of the major scales in order of fifths. Uh, if you look at any scale book, the scale book will present the scales, if it's a good one, in a logical order, in this order of fifths. You'll see the key signatures also progressing in a logical order and you'll usually also see a common diagram for the circle of fifths and if you go on the internet and type in circle of fifths you'll find all kinds of information. Uh, I mentioned that scales can be spelled in one of two ways. There's three enharmonic spellings. If you're not sure of a spelling and you're starting on a black key, if you have a choice between using a sharp or a flat, if you spell the scale as a flat key you'll always be right. Um, for instance, Here's the A flat major scale. Um, we do not spell it as a G sharp scale for a very practical reason. If you spell it as a G sharp scale, um, you're eventually going to have to use what's called a double sharp. And a, a double sharp is used in music. There's really no big deal about it. But it becomes impractical to use in a key signature. If I had to spell this scale G sharp, A sharp, B sharp, C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F double sharp. G sharp. So again, F double sharp is simply a whole step. And we're doing that for reasons of grammar, in a sense. Um, just like English has grammar and spelling, music has it as well. When you're spelling a scale, you want to spell it in terms of steps. And steps visually on a musical staff look like a space note followed by a line note, followed by the next space, followed by the next line. And uh, we don't want to have two G's in a scale, and that's what would happen. Uh, in this case, or two Fs, we don't want to have that. So if we spelled it uh, G sharp, A sharp, B sharp, C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, and then we'd have to say G, G sharp, that really wouldn't work out very well. Um, these tetrachord groups also, uh, I group them in what I call similar or dissimilar tetrachords. So for instance, the C major scale has two similar tetrachords call them similar because it's the only major scale that uses all white keys. Now if you go to the G scale, well I call this dissimilar. And you can see for obvious reasons the right hand, D, E, F sharp, G, well we're playing one black key. Um, however, if we continue up to D, we'll go down an octave here, um, D has a, two what I call similar tetrachords. You have a black key and a white key on the last or the third and fourth notes of each tetrachord. So you can use that to help you learn some of the scales. Uh, again, if we continue up the pattern to A, well, A has a dissimilar set of tetrachords. Here you have one black key, here you have 
two black keys. But if you continue up again, I'm going to go down, uh, down uh, here. You end up with two similar tetrachords, E major. You have two white keys on the outside, two black keys in the middle. Continuing up to B, well, those are dissimilar. Of course, you have three black keys here and, and two here. Then uh, continuing up, dissimilar again, F sharp or G flat. Even though we have three black keys here and three black keys here, you can see that these th three black keys are sequential, one after another, and these are not. You have a white key in the middle. D flat, well, those are similar tetrachords. You have this one white key situated as the third note in the series of those four note tetrachords. And, and then we have the A flat, which is, I'll go down here, which is dissimilar. And then E flat major, which is similar. You have two white keys in the middle. B flat major is dissimilar. And F will go down an octave again, or a few octaves, dissimilar. And we're back to C. So um, five of these major scales have what I call similar tetrachords. So uh, you have C major, which is similar. You have C sharp, which is similar. You have D, which is similar. You have E flat, which is similar. You have E, which is similar. And then the rest of the groups are essentially dissimilar. So you have five major scales that have similar kinds of tetrachord groups. And when you're practicing them, again, you can practice them um, like I'm showing you here. Your left hand, and then you're followed by your right hand. No thumbs. I leave the thumbs out for a very practical reason. Uh, when you learn something, you want to do one thing at a time, not two. So ordinarily, when you're playing a major scale, you're playing it with one hand. and the conventional fingering has us cross the thumb under. And when you cross the thumb under, it adds an element of complication uh, to learning the scale. And it also disturbs this tetrachord group we're trying to learn. Ordinarily, I would play the first three notes of the C major scale and cross my thumb under. Well, that breaks the scale into a group of three and a group of four. And I really don't want to be bothered by that. Um, Believe it or not, early keyboard music did not use the thumbs. And there's a very practical reason for that. The thumb is really not a finger, is it? It's an opposable thumb. It moves in the opposite direction. It's somewhat problematic and requires special care to use. So it's really just better just, just to use those fingers. Same fingering throughout all the scales. Um, you can also uh, practice the major scales with one hand. So you could just play the right hand, let's say, and lift your hand, and then repeat the note. Repeat the tetrachord. And do the same thing with the left hand. Or you could do the same thing, play identical tetrachords in both hands. Be a bit creative. My definition of practicing, especially when you're older, as an adult, is to take a simple idea and approach it in a variety of different ways. So let's say three different ways when you're learning a major scale. So you might learn it, uh, again, in a sequence, left hand followed by the right hand. You might play it with one hand exclusively, or the left hand exclusively, or both hands similar. So you really digest it and really learn it. If you practice the same thing over and over again in one way, you're going to uh, ultimately undermine your practicing. Uh, we're talking about um, major scales and how major scales are constructed. And you can think of a major scale in a variety of different ways. But again, a very practical way to consider the major scale is as two groups of four notes, two tetrachord groups. And every time you create or learn a new scale, you're building on the old scale. In effect, you may not realize it, but every major scale contains half of two other scales. So again, the C major scale, the 
last four notes of the scale, G, A, B, C, are actually the first four notes of the G scale. If you look again at the C scale, the first four notes of the C scale are actually the last four notes of the F scale. So although we think of the major scale as being 12 separate major scales, and sometimes three of those being spelled in different ways, it's really one big idea, all linked together. Of course, that one big idea is too big to use, uh, so we frame them. We frame them within what's called an octave, the octave being eight, eight notes. It's a doubling uh, of vibration. We have seven unique letter names in a major scale, not including the octave. Um, you can have up to seven sharps in the key signature. Conversely, you can have up to seven flats in the key signature. Uh, regardless of the number of sharps in the key signature, there's one sharp that's always common, and that's F sharp. So if you see a key signature with one sharp or two sharps or three sharps, the first sharp will always have to be F sharp. Uh, and every time you add a sharp, you're going in, in a logical order. The order being you're going up an interval of a fifth. Now you might say, well, gosh, it might be a little hard to determine what's up a fifth from F sharp. But really, again, it's very simple. You just recite the alphabet. F, G starts over again with A, B, C. So F, G, A, B, C. Well, basically, if we're talking about sharps, uh, just make the C into a C sharp. So F sharp up to C sharp is your up a fifth. Uh, if you're going up a fifth from C, well, C, D, E, F, G, that's G sharp. And you'll see the sharps written in the key signature, first F sharp, then C sharp, then G sharp. Now when they're written, well, sometimes they go up a fifth, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they go down a fourth. Why would they do that? Well, a, the, an interval of a fifth and a fourth is essentially the same thing. So uh, up a fifth from C is G, but if you invert the interval, you go down, that's a fourth. It's basically the same notes, very similar sound as well. But those are referred to as perfect fourths or perfect fifths. If uh, you're running out of room on the staff, the staff, musical staff only has five lines, we want to stay on the staff when we're notating the key signature. So we can't keep going up a fifth on the staff because we need lots of ledger lines, and that just would be really impractical. So the intervals invert in terms of their notation sometimes. But um, seven sh ultimately, seven sharps uh, in a key signature, the key that has the most sharps is C sharp. C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B sharp, C sharp. That's not the order of the sharps in the key signature, but that's the C sharp major scale. Um, C major has no sharps or flats. C sharp has the most sharps, and C flat has the most flats. You could spell this as B, B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B, or you could spell it as C flat. C flat, D flat, E flat, F flat, G flat, A flat, B flat, C flat. Uh, if you play harp, you're probably familiar with the key of C flat. Um, ordinarily, a pianist is not going to encounter the key of C flat as such. But um, this, that's sort of easy to remember because the C's have all the sharps, all the flats, or nothing at all. That's a little trick that, that I've, uh, I've learned over the years. Um, flats, you're going to be going down a fifth in a key signature. So regardless of the number of flats in a key signature, you can have up to seven flats. You'll always have to have at least one flat, which is B flat. All of the key, flat key signatures will start with B flat, and they will uh, be added going down a fifth. So first would be B flat, down a fifth from B flat, B, A, G, F, E flat down a fifth, down a fifth from E flat is A flat, and down a fifth from A flat is D flat. So uh, the order of the sharps or flats in a key signature is in a logical order. 
If you don't remember them right away, that's fine. But at least you know how to figure them out without a book. And if you do have a book, you can at least recognize how the book is put together. But again, there's only 12 major scales, essentially. As many numbers as there are in a watch, right? Uh, three of those have more than one spelling. I showed you a few here. C sharp can also be spelled as D flat. B can be spelled as C flat. And F sharp can be spelled as G flat. And guess what? They're the scales that use all the black keys. So that's one way to remember. And there's a myth that playing in sharp keys or flat keys is difficult. Actually, in many ways, it's much easier than playing in a white key like C major. Well, why would you say that? Well, the black keys, you have something to sort of grab hold of. It's really common uh, for musicians or composers, pianists who don't even read music. Famous ones like Irving Berlin, let's say, or say Stevie Wonder. They like to play in those keys. There's a tactile uh, advantage to it in some ways. Uh, when you play in C major, like a white key, well, you're playing on a flat surface, and you have to compensate. You have fingers of different lengths. Um, you have to adjust with the wrist. And the piano is essentially made to go with your hand. The thumbs like to play the white keys, and the, the other fingers above are conducive to playing the black keys. So don't be afraid of learning the black key scales. The scales that use all the, sharp, uh, all the black keys are the ones that can be spelled in more than one way. The, the ones I would recommend to focus on, the more difficult ones, are what I call the E's and the A's. So E major, E flat major, A major, A flat major. Those are, can be a little trickier. They're not difficult necessarily, but um, certainly Scales with one sharp, like G, or, or one flat, like F, even two. D major has two sharps. Uh, B flat has two flats. Those are simpler, although the fingering can be a little problematic as well. So uh, just be aware that uh, when you're learning a major scale again, we want to think of the scale as two sets of four notes, or as a tetrachord. That's the fastest, most productive use of your time. And it will also help you to learn the scales in a musical way. And really, that's what we're about. We're, we want to learn music in the end. We're not just learning the scales just to make ourselves crazy or waste time. The scales are the underpinning of all of the music that you're going to play. And they essentially amount to the rule, the underlying rule of the song, the right notes. If you have exceptions, those are expressed as accidentals, and accidental being a sharp, a flat, or a natural that's not in a key signature. So. That's my tetrachord lesson today, and uh, I hope you found it interesting. If you need some more uh, advice or help, you can go to the pianolesson.com and uh, send me a note, and uh, I'll do my best to answer your question. Thanks for watching today. I'm Jonathan Eder. This is The Piano Lesson.